How blessed am I in my just censure, in my true opinion. A lack for lesser knowledge, how accursed in being so blessed. There may be in the cup a spider steeped, and one may drink, depart, and yet partake no venom, for his knowledge is not infected. But if one present the abhorred ingredient to his eye, make known how he hath drunk, he cracks his gorge, his sides, with violent hefts. I have drunk and seen the spider. That speech comes from early in Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. King Leontes believes that his wife has been cheating on him with his best friend for a long time. During the years when he didn't know, he was fine. Being unaware of the poison in his drink protected him. But now he knows, and now it poisons him. Of course, the affair is all in his mind, but such is the nature of perspective. Today is the first part in a new series where I'll be analyzing an individual map in Fire Emblem and see how good it is both for gameplay and Ludo narrative. Today the map we're going to take a look at is Alencia's Gambit, the final map from Part 2 of Fire Emblem Radiant Dawn. Part 2 of Countries and Kings is a short arc between the adventures of the Dawn Brigade and the return of the Grail mercenaries from Path of Radiance. Of Countries and Kings establishes the new global context after Dayan liberated itself from the Benyon Empire. Alencia, the young new queen of Crimea, sits on an unstable throne. The liberation of Dayan, a country that had ravaged Crimea only a few years earlier, threatens her crown. This national uneasiness erupts into outright rebellion, with Duke Ludvek leading a coup to take the throne. He views Alencia as weak and liable to lead Crimea back into being the victim of colonial expansion. In an attempt to quell rebellion, Alencia sends the Crimean royal knights to put down a small insurrection. What she realizes all too late is that this rural insurrection is a smokescreen. With Joffrey's royal knights pulled away from the capital, Alencia's remaining forces are attacked. The royal knights realize the ruse and send up a flare, but it's too late. The castle is under siege by Duke Ludvek. Not only are the knights gone, but Lucia, one of Alencia's key advisors and strongest fighters, has been captured by Ludvek. This is a lot of firepower stripped from the player. To defend the castle, the player has Alencia herself, along with the Laguzne Luci, Leth, and Mordecai, the Heron Leanne, the thief Heather, the country bumpkins Brahm and Nefni, the newly recruited sage Khalil, and the formidable dragon master Har. Har is by far the player's best piece, combining the player's best offense, defense, and mobility in one unit. But that's about it. We're a band of misfits playing Moneyball while the evil empire is battering down the gates. Along with a paltry group of allied units, this ragtag group must defend against the mighty force of 40 brought by Ludvek, with more reinforcements on the way. For the player to win, they must defend the castle gate for 15 turns, or kill Ludvek to end the fight early. For a new player, this is a daunting proposition. The enemy is pouring in from the left and from the right. As well, some of Ludvek's forces have already clawed their way up into the middle platform, only a mere turn or two away from pressuring the gate. The plan is simple, execution difficult. On the map, there are a couple of nicely placed choke points, specifically the one tile wide points on the stairs to the left and the sandbags on the right. The player needs to quickly find ways to plug these choke points while clearing the enemies out from the middle platform. The units given to the player offer some interesting strategic problems and tools. Outside of Har, most characters have severe weaknesses. Nilucci, Leth, and Mordecai have to manage their Laguz gauges, meaning that the player isn't just managing their HP, but also has to rotate them around so that they don't untransform and get overwhelmed at the choke points. Brahm and Nefni offer some decent bulk, but they're fairly immobile and need massive bonus experience investment to be offensively proficient. It's not all doom and gloom though, there are some nice tools here for the player. Leanne is a dancer, meaning she can give any player character a second action. Alencia can fly, heal, use Kanto to move after any action, and her personal weapon, the Amidi, is a powerful brave weapon and will kill almost every enemy in one round of combat. Har flies and kills everything and dies to nothing. Only the periodic Thunder Mage poses any threat. Khalil offers nice 1-2 range and comes with a Meteor Tome that can snipe enemies from 3-10 to 10 range. And on turn 1, the Falcon Knight Marcia appears to aid Alencia's army. Not only does this mean that the player's forces are boosted, it also means that Joffrey's royal knights are en route to the castle. But can we stand strong enough until they arrive? 
For many new players, the answer is probably not. The map is taxing, and 15 turns is a long time to hold the lines. But it doesn't mean we're not going to try. Push hard deep towards the right to hold the sandbags, push Brahm and Nefni to the left with Mordecai and Leth to hold the stairs. Using Alencia, Lian, and Khalil work the middle enemies. Of all the enemies on this map, they are priority number one. The good news is that the quickest way towards the gate can be blocked by someone standing on this ledge. You have the high ground. Using this ledge not only suffocates the enemies within your small pincer, but also gives you combat advantages that help level the playing field against the Ludvekian hordes. To an experienced Fire Emblem player, holding choke points is easy, but for a new player, especially a player making their first run through a game, it can be challenging. The skills required to hold such highly contested zones will require very thoughtful use of vulneraries, concoctions, and heals. Up until this point, Radiant Dawn hasn't really asked the player to hold choke points as intensely as it is asked in Alencia's Gambit. During the siege, a couple of thoughts will likely nag the player. Marsha made it, will the rest of the Royal Knights make it, and what's with all the space on the right side of the map? Well, if those are your questions, turn 8 is the turn for you. For many players, this could be the shifting point of the battle. 8 turns doesn't sound like a lot, but in Fire Emblem, 8 turns can be an eternity. That's a lot of fighting, a lot of damage, and a lot of resource expenditure that is piled up. For some players, their lines could be beginning to crack. For others, they could be breaking through. For either side, turn 8 shifts the battle. From the top right storms the Royal Knights. Joffrey, Makalov, Astrid, Danved, he of the Tiger and Bear, and Kieran arrive and can relieve pressure on the player and press the enemies. Their path is set. Funneled by the right side hallway, they will press the enemy and pull heat away from the sandbag choke point. If the player is going for the Ludvet kill, this will be a moment to open a path and cut through. The more ambitious player also looking to snag the Silver Great Lance and the Draco Shield will now have a much greater opening, but more on those items later. This tide shift isn't necessarily because the Royal Knights are good on their own. Most are mediocre, Astrid is downright terrible, but it's a lot more firepower and actions given to the player. And sometimes, number of actions is your most valuable resource. From here, the map will likely continue with the player either killing Ludvek or running out the clock. Either way, the impression for many players, and certainly for me on my first playthrough, is that Alencia's Gambit is one of the best maps in the series. It's exciting, it's large, it's climactic. The scale of this battle, played straight, is a rare scope. No game in the series, not Genealogy of the Holy War, not Path of Radiance, not Three Houses, captures the massive scale of Radiant Dawn. For many, the pinnacle of Radiant Dawn's scope is the desperation of Valencia's Gambit. It's a clash of multiple armies, it's forces reunited, it's a coup attempt against a major nation as a side story to the Dawn Brigade Rebellion from Part 1. The map being viewed as an epic and sweeping moment is backed up by data, and of course, you know, we, we got data, I always got data. In the 369 nice responses to a survey on Alencia's Gambit map quality, a plurality of voters were a full 10 out of 10. 26.8% of the responses were 10 out of 10, and 77.2% of the total votes scored Alencia's Gambit as at least an 8 out of 10. This is an overwhelmingly positive reception, with the average rating sitting at 8.15 out of 10. Even adjusting for a margin error around 5%, this is a beloved map. I'm not surprised at all by this. For one, this map was voted as the first map I should do on this series. In fact, if you want to vote for which map I do, consider joining Patreon.com, link down in the description. Any patrons at $10 a month or higher get to nominate a map, while any patron or YouTube member at any level can vote on which map I'll do. Here are the results from the poll for this video. If any of these other maps pique your interest, consider a subscription for as little as $1 a month. On screen right now are the names of all the patrons and YouTube members who make this channel possible. Here's some thoughts from Patreon supporters, and let's see how they stack up to what I've said. You can cheese the map by quickly killing Ludvek with Har and get a boring anti-climax to part 2. Alternatively, you can take it slow, focus on grabbing all the goodies, and get one of the most fun maps in the series, says Bees. 2E offers a lot of versatile gameplay elements that let you decide on how to approach. Whether you choke certain areas or boss rush, you can do, well, better than most Radiant Dawn maps, says BMO McGrim. 2E has an interesting evolving defense with multiple choke points, a stealable stat booster, and eventual blue reinforcements. However, it all feels pointless due to a relatively easy boss kill to end the map, says Danny Doyle. The map really makes you a part of Alencia and Company's last stand, as you have to defend your ground for 15 turns and you can feel your units giving it their all, or you can send in Har and end the chapter in 3 turns, says Moderation Dev. 
The amount of and quality of the reinforcements makes it pretty challenging to push forward into the map as a whole. Joffrey and the Crimean Knights showing up on the lower level to help is a cool idea but doesn't really relieve any pressure since they're already arriving late and there are enemies blocking them from joining the main force. From a Ludo narrative perspective, I think it was a missed opportunity to not put them in a better position to immediately help, says Quaros. I think it's pretty cool letting Har solo the map. I also think it's pretty cool how Joffrey and the boys show up a bit too late to offer much help, says Starry. I like the gameplay decisions that come with a kill boss plus defense map. You always have the option to cheese with Har, but I find playing straight up defense to be satisfying in its own right, says ToughKid42. Alencia's Gambit is actually pretty fun for filthy casuals like myself because it is the game's particular equivalent of having your cake and eating it too. This is the finale of the part of the game that gives you a bunch of already promoted tier 2 units, letting you feel way stronger than the Dawn Brigade right out of the gate, only to then back those strong units into a corner with a very juicy defense chapter that highlights a beloved character's struggle with her new job, says Vivian Aladrin. A lot of those comments here focus on the split nature of the map how you can take it slow or go fast, and this is a dichotomy that emerges on repeat playthroughs. You may have noticed throughout this video I keep saying that Alencia's Gambit is fantastic on a first playthrough, or for a new player. And yeah, on a first playthrough this map is fantastic. The narrative climax, the desperation, the overwhelming numbers, the exotic survive objective. But what happens on a second playthrough? See, this map has two major problems that have to do with that sexy little objective, survive 15 turns or defeat the boss. On a first playthrough, before the player has a full grasp of Radiant Dawn's gameplay and structure, it's easy for the intended flow of the chapter to happen. The overwhelming majority of chapters up to this point in the game require the player to press the enemy. Look at chapter 1-1, Maiden of Miracles. The player begins at the bottom, and they have to reach an escape point at the top. The player must push their army up, engaging the enemy, and claw their way up to the escape point. Almost every map before Alencia's Gambit is structured like this, and the raw inertia of that style will compel a new player to force the map the same way they force every map. Run out and engage the enemy. Chew up the choke points. Kill them all. It's called Alencia's Gambit. It's like the Queen's Gambit, that chess move where you aggressively hold the middle of the map until you carve your way to the boss. But... Let's take a look at that objective a little more closely. The objective only asks you to survive or kill the boss, not both. So let's say you undeploy everyone. There's been budget cuts and this castle in ain't getting defended. We're leaving Alencia out there on her own. This should be a recipe for disaster. There's no way this works. It can't. Can it? Alencia holds the line and orders the allied units to target the gate. For the first couple of turns, the allies and the enemies work towards the gate. Eventually, the allies will form a two-row wide buffer between Alencia and the enemy forces. But these guys are yellow units. There's no way they can last 15 turns. Even with our physics staff, they can heal them and prevent the crossbow guys from reaching Alencia. No. No, this, this can't be happening. This, this can't be real. Forget beating Path of Radiance without attacking on player phase. We're beating Radiant Dawn without attacking, period. Doing this strategy, I lost Marcia, and the Royal Knights got caught up in combat as well, but further optimizing would prevent all this. This is a guaranteed, reliable, out-of-the-box free strategy that requires no effort. The most remarkable part of this strategy is that it's a losing strategy. Ludvek is winning. All he has to do is keep going. Alencia's mend and physics staffs will run out, and she's simply no match for the bow guns. But no. Fifteen turns pass, and Ludwig lays down his arms. He gives up. He chooses to lose. Perhaps there's honor here, or something about Ludwig that we never knew before. He doesn't want to win this way, so he doesn't. It makes sense why this strategy would be viable. Part 2 as a whole is mostly a series of side stories with preset armies. There isn't a whole lot of unit and army building to go around. In a worst case scenario, it's entirely possible that the player never recruited Har or Heather, maybe they lost any of Braum, Nefni, Mordecai, Leth, or etc. on a previous map. 
The last thing the developers would want is for the player to get softlocked on this map. This is the periodic folly of missable characters and permadeath, but it's hardly a death sentence for the map in my mind. This strategy is a monument to the idea of optimizing the fun out of a game. While players do tend to want to optimize the fun out of games, this strategy is so extreme that I've basically never seen anyone actually do it. Outside of a couple of levels for Alencia, all extrinsic rewards outside of winning are abdicated. Yeah, winning is the most important part, but for many players, the joy of training their favorite characters and looting the level is a greater draw. Besides, this stall strategy is so boring, so unfun, that I genuinely doubt that any significant portion of players ever does it or does it consistently. Nah. The real problem is this little objective right underneath survive. For experienced players, Kill Boss immediately sends alarm bells ringing for Boss Rush O'Clock, which is the long form of Har O'Clock. Without any complicated setup, you can do something like this. This is base Har and base Alencia. And it's all over. So we have two extremes, wall for 15 turns and do nothing, or swarm Ludvek quickly and end the map super early. Neither of these methods get across the intended experience, which is much closer to the chapter progression I described at the beginning of the video. So what does the map do to motivate the player against either of these extremes? The big money is the items. Enemies on the map drop these items. Silver Great Lance, Energy Drop, and the Nullify skill. There are four hidden items. A coin, two Alevi Grasses, and an Arm Scroll. Three stealable Vulneraries, four stealable coins, a stealable Reaper card, and the Grand Prize, a stealable Draco Shield. Ludvek himself drops a Tomahawk, but since his death ends the map, I'm not counting it. This is a lot of loot. For many players, looting items is the most fun you can possibly have playing a game. Most of the items here are pretty worthless, but the Draco Shield is so tantalizing, so thirst-inducing, and so difficult to acquire that it becomes a fun puzzle on its own. You need to find a way to get Heather to the General to steal it while keeping her alive and timing the theft so that you can kill Ludvek immediately or get Heather out. It's pretty difficult and one of the harder optional challenges in Radiant Dawn. This is where we see the fun in defense maps for many players. Most don't play fast and turns never enter their mind. Defense maps force that issue. For the looter, defense maps place a hard limit on how long they have to collect all the items. It presses a slower, completionist player in a way most maps don't. For the loot and EXP obsessed, Alencia's Gambit is some of the most fun in the series. It's the most fun you can possibly have. But this is all really an illusion. For players who intrinsically have fun playing this way, regardless of actual benefits, none of what I'm about to say matters. After playing Radiant Dawn once, I realized that a single Draco shield makes basically no difference. The game is so long that plus two defense isn't a good payout for how much work it is to get it. On top of that, bonus experience is so plentiful and so powerful, at least on normal mode, that the experience gained from standing and fighting for the full 15 turns impacts the trained characters minimally. And the problem is that once I've seen how little these items matter, and seen how easy it is to break this map short way and long way, or hamburger and hot dog style if you will, I can't unsee it. There is no going back. How then do we elevate this map? Some of the best maps in Fire Emblem bring out the intended experience in all players, whether slower or faster paced, because the map does a great job at forcing the issue. See the Binding Blade Chapter 11a Villages for a good example. I think that the major correction needed is to the kill boss objective. Thank you to user Scuba Luigi for pointing this out in the comments section, but Elincia's Gambit was reused as a Fire Emblem Fates DLC map called Vanguard Dawn. Unfortunately, I can't play it now for reasons, so let's enjoy Phoenix Master 1's playthrough. The notable change between Alencia's Gambit and Vanguard Dawn is that there are now three bosses. Even when played with a very powerful army of Cap DLC characters, the player is forced to get crafty, smartly divide their forces, and push aggressively to defeat all three bosses and to get all the items. By adding a new boss to the left and right flanks, we'll call them Ludvek's commanders, the pressure to push becomes stronger. And instead of surviving 15 turns, you need to kill the bosses within 15 turns or else Ludvek's reinforcements will overrun the castle. 
For an example of how not having something to do on, like, let's say the left side of the map creates problems, when I beat this map for footage, I accidentally stumbled upon fortuitous foolishness. An enemy cleric stood on the stairway choke point, forever blocking both armies from advancing. I had no need to get past him, so I let him stand there and was rewarded handsomely for my clever inaction. Needing to kill all three bosses would also give the Royal Knights more to do. The time and place that they arrive makes life incredibly boring for them. Most of the enemies are probably a good two to three turns away from them, or have already been thinned out extensively by Har. Even the most stalwart fans of this map generally wish there was more for the Royal Knights to do. By shifting their entry down a good 10 spaces or even more, it gets them into the action much more quickly. If this was a tri-boss kill map, the Royal Knights would provide the much needed support they supposedly do bring by freeing up the forces to crush the left flank boss while they handle the right. These changes would make the map a lot better, but the trouble with Alencia's Gambit is that its flaws are what makes it interesting. The quality of the map will vary wildly based on what a player finds intrinsically rewarding. For many, the act of gaining EXP and looting the items is reward enough itself. It doesn't matter that none of it matters to the game. It matters to them. This attitude is common and is why this map is viewed so fondly. The spider Mad King Leonte sees in this cup is the truth of his wife's affair, or at least his perceived truth. His wife is not having an affair, but he sees it. Alencia's Gambit could, on paper, be massively improved. I think it would benefit from massive improvement, but perhaps more than any other map in the series. The quality of it depends on if you see the spider, and if you even care. The light reflects differently off this map for every player. There's something beautiful about it. How one mid-game map can inspire an almost primal internet rage, a string of Reddit forums and arguments that stretch endlessly forwards and backwards into eternity.